Hello and welcome to this brief introduction to the Neurophototherapy Project, which is a creative practice-based self-recovery tool for late discovered autistic women and marginalized genders. I just want to explain that um, for this slide presentation, I'm going to be alternating between text-based and visual slides. Um, this is with visual thinkers in mind and also because the, the um, images that I'll share will help illustrate some of the aspects of the project too. So I'm going to um, start sharing um, some slides, but first of all, I just want to introduce myself very briefly. I am Sonia Bue. I'm a visual artist. I'm a writer about autism and art. And I'm also a consultant to art organizations relating to neurodivergent creativity and best practice for supporting neurodivergent creatives in the arts. So this is the first image that I want to share with you. And um, it is um, part of the performative strand of my work and it's quite a late image in the project. Um, it shows some collage pieces which I've made also, so it includes collage aspects of this project and also working with objects. So it's got three elements in it. And as I say, it's, a, it's a, an image that's come through quite late on in, in the maker phase of the project, which is what I've been working on first of all. So what is neurophototherapy? Neurophototherapy is a research and development project funded by Arts Council England to create a model for self-recovery following a late autism diagnosis for women and marginalized genders. It's based on an existing practice of phototherapy, but has been reworked to focus on uncovering and building identity and safe and playful unmasking. It's also been reconsidered to allow for autonomous processes as opposed to cooperative processes. The original phototherapy practice which inspired this project emerged from a co-counseling relationship. Neurophototherapy can be practiced using a primary relationship with a camera. So that's the, one of the main adaptations that I've made for this work. It will be taken forward at the next stage of funding with a group of participants with an exhibition outcome. So this second image that I'm sharing with you comes from before the project. Um, this is sort of really, really very early stages of exploring ideas around performative photography and collage during the first lockdown. And um, I'm using this because um, it actually shows aspects of the project's evolution, where it's come from, and uh, the sort of practices that I was engaged in, um, which have led to this project. So we'll go a bit more into detail about that now and talk about how did neurophototherapy come into being. It really emerged from my autobiographical photography practice, which, as I say, developed during lockdown. I was isolated from my studio and uh, couldn't engage in many of the other art practices in my multi-form practice. So I had my camera and I had myself and this strand of work um, developed during this period as I was documenting myself and my responses. Um, during the early moments of the COVID pandemic. Neurophototherapy is also inspired by an online exhibition of the late artist Joe Spence's work entitled Phototherapy at the Richard Saltoon Gallery. And this was really a, an extraordinary encounter for me with a body of work um, made by Joe Spence um, exploring uh, all kinds of aspects of her life, um, including very challenging aspects of her life. Um, 
And it really was um, a eureka moment when I encountered this work and I, I recommend it. It, it. It's still available to view, I think, until October online. Neurophototherapy is also informed by my consultancy and mentoring work across the art sector. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. It was also sparked by my involvement as a film artist for the Playing a Part project, which um, many of you might have come across, I hope, um, and know about a project created and, and run by uh, Professor Nicola Shaughnessy to um, explore and develop creative workshops for autistic um, pupils. I was engaged as a film artist on this project and observing pupils um, in, in secondary schools was really uh, very eye-opening for me and as part of um, what has kind of enabled me to, to work on, on my neurodivergence in my own practice. So this is a, an image from late on in the project again, and um, it is using a, um, a, a wooden block, which is part of a set of um, vintage children's wooden blocks uh, for sort of building and constructing and playing with. And um, I've painted and collaged an eye on, onto it, obviously. And it's really about um, articulating the, the re reconnecting with myself and observing myself and also sort of um, looking out onto the world as my authentic self as, a, as an autistic woman. So why neurophototherapy? Well, my work in the art sector, as I said, um, is a big part of it and it's enabled me to be in contact with a very large number of late diagnosed neurodivergent art professionals in need of support. And I encountered a pattern. Diagnosis generally followed by a vacuum of aftercare and the emotional recovery, which I perceive as a need from a lifetime of misidentification and a need to assimilate a diagnosis is not recognized as a need, I feel. And mental health support was either lacking for these um, individuals or hard to get and often inappropriate. So neurophototherapy speaks to aspects of an unmet need with a new self-recovery strategy tailored to our specific needs, which includes playful and masking to support positive autistic identification. And this image was created um, around, uh, obviously around about the 4th of March. Um, and this is the date of my autism diagnosis, my official diagnosis. And uh, I really wanted to commemorate this as part of the project and um, came up with this idea of, of an autversary. Um, I've never really wanted to celebrate a birthday um, and um, found birthdays very difficult. But I really, really wanted to um, celebrate this anniversary. And um, it, uh, I shared it on, on Instagram and it got a, a lot of likes, a lot of comments, and um, there was a real sense of uh, celebration and enablement of um, other autistic people to think about um, celebrating their diagnosis too. So how does neurophototherapy fit into the landscape of the arts? Now, this is an important question, I think, to, to address at this point. Um, Autistic women and marginalized genders seem to me to be very highly represented in the arts, contrary to um, stereotype. We do seem to gravitate towards the creative sector. And uh, we're known to be more likely to be late diagnosed than those presenting with more stereotypical profiles. So I think that's, that's a very important point to make, that uh, we are many 
in the arts and um you know it it really does go against stereotypes common stereotypes of of autism uh, there's both a serious lack of psychological support following late diagnosis and a lack of structure in freelance art environments and i think these two things create a very difficult dynamic for us i i believe that you know we would still obviously encounter barriers and difficulties um, but that more structured environments with clearer professional pathways would possibly be more helpful so we've got this we've got this um additional challenge in a way that we're working in freelance environments where so much is predicated on uh, personal interactions and relationships and networking and the ability to move you know very um, effectively through social environments and uh, this is obviously the difficulty with this is actually going to obviously impact again on on mental health so it's a bit of a can be a bit of a vicious cycle for, for some people but on the other hand there are some innovatory projects in the arts which are providing pockets of support including self-led initiatives and i think this is really interesting because it's the other side of the coin of having uh, a, a lack of structure if you like and sort of more free-flowing um, environments which enable people to be very creative and um, innovate. Uh, my experience in a variety of settings indicates an urgent and profound need for emotional and psychological adjustment to diagnosis for professional creatives. But this model is also proposed for amateur creatives. And I, I really like that idea that um, you can pick this model up at whatever point that you're at. Um, it could help in your professional life to develop um, another side to your practice or take on new skills or, or break through some, some difficulties you might be experiencing in terms of um, unmasking and exploring identity. Um, or it can equally be used by um, somebody who just wants to have a go and would enjoy and benefit from um, playful unmasking at home. So the need for emotional assimilation of a diagnosis often, in my experience, presents as a personal need, but can also be a barrier to career progression because of the mental health um, impact, as I've mentioned. And therefore, I proposed my work both as emotional support and support for continuous professional development, as far as the Arts Council is concerned. Um, this is an image that I made around about the same time as my autversary <laughs> portrait. And um, I was really keen on this idea of commemorating five years of discovery and what would that be like in my universe? And might I have a set of stamps commissioned um, around the theme of five years of disco discovery? And uh, what might it be like to have this um, set of stamps made and a, and a book of stamps? So I set about um, creating uh, a, what would be the cover of the booklet of stamps. Um, and the idea for the stamps itself, I explored a little bit, but that kind of fizzled out. And it, it was an interesting avenue for a while, but um, I didn't take it any further in the end. So, what neurophototherapy isn't is a very important thing to assert, I think. Um, it doesn't claim to be a single solution to the emotional assimilation of a late diagnosis. Rather, it can be used alongside a range of other strategies. And I have noticed that um, due to the lack of uh, support that's out there, we do tend to need to tap into and create for ourselves a patchwork of strategies and supports um, following a, a late diagnosis. It also isn't therapy with a large T, although therapy's in the title. Participants will therefore not engage in a therapeutic relationship with another person 
rather they will engage in a conversation with the self via a playful exploration of identity using a combination of photographic and collage techniques. And I think that's, that's important as well, is that um, it can be very light touch and it is intended to be exploring through playfulness. This is um, an image which I also created very early on in the project. Um, it does relate to the lockdown as well. So um, I was exploring identity and using false noses and um, really sort of thinking through an identification which developed with birds and this idea that I would like to um, sort of think of the noses that I was using as almost as beaks and um, that I would like to develop wings and I think this is what's so wonderful about collage and also um, disguise dressing up performance is that you can really go on flights of fantasy and um, this can be um, really beneficial in terms of just a sense of well-being and um, for me the act of sharing these images as well is a way of um, showing myself uh, more authentically if you like even though it looks as though this is a very constructed and false image actually what it does for me is enable me to express some of my inner life in a very um, pleasing and, uh, and powerful way. So the project outline is um, as follows. It is due to run for nine months and started in February 2021. The first phase uh, is, has been making the work. So I've created a body of work to articulate a potential self-recovery model. Um, all of which currently can be found on um, my Instagram account, which is at lowercase s for sugar underscore bue, B O U E. Um, and then following the maker phase, there's going to be a framing it phase, which um, I want to happen neurodivergently. So I have commissioned reflective writings by three key experts, Professor Nicola Shaughnessy, who I think will look at my work in terms of performance, and um, Dr. Dawn Choi Leong, who I think will look at it as embodied art practice research, and Dr. Chloe, Chloe Faraha, who will probably look at the work, I think, from um, more of a, um, a social uh, science perspective. Um, and also with relation to the practical side of the project, which is, um, you know, de delivering this to participants and, and sort of thinking through ideas about workshops, maybe. And the next phase will be disseminating the work with a series of talks and online exhibition of works. Um, in a way, this is part of that because this is obviously a talk and um, not everything happens in sequence. Um, and then there'll be a recruiting phase where I will invite participants for the next phase of the project using all the products that I've created to help explain the model to them. This is a, an image which I made actually before neurophototherapy began. Um, I made it during a piece of commissioned work for John Adams on the project which was called Congress, um, which was researching the barriers for neurodivergent people in the arts through Arts Council funding. And John commissioned me to make some responses to the survey that he rolled out to neurodivergent creatives across the country, um, exploring the barriers and um, also looking at our positive attributes in terms of our creativity. And uh, this is me sort of wanting to express um, an idea which came through 
very strongly in the survey that we are deep thinkers and that very often this is missed by neuronormative people when we are in conversation and that there's a lot going on um, that probably can't be seen um, but is being experienced and felt. And it's another example of how you can use this technique to um, express um, ideas about internal states and also to think about identity. So the potential benefits of neurophototherapy are that it seeks to draw on the inherent benefits of creative practice to allow for self-reflection. And I call this sort of therapy with a small t. Participants may benefit from a gentle life review or journaling at their own pace and with all elements of the process within their control, choosing whether and when to share images. Now, I think this is important to say that for me, sharing images is very important, it's very empowering, but I understand that for other people it may need to be a quieter, more private process. And when I say that all elements of the process are within their control with this method, the participant controls um, the camera, the setting, the image, the editing, and then what happens to the image and how the image is used. Um, and I think that's, that's very important in terms of enabling and freeing up this unmasking process and exploring identity and feeling safe about that. So my process works have been shared on Instagram as a resource to dip into and engage with at any level. It has enabled me to articulate my neurological being as a congruent entity. And I talk about congruence a lot because I believe that um, late diagnosis means that we've gone through a lifetime, probably masking our autism. And um, this can be extremely fragmenting to identity and to a sense of uh, who we are and our self-worth. Um, and for me, creating and sharing my images has been empowering. And I personally experience a more authentic and seamless connection with the neuronormative world. So I'm excited to see whether this replicates for participants. Collage, as I think I've hinted at uh, throughout this, enables a wide variety of responses and can help participants work across time by using childhood photographs if they wish. And this is just one example of myself using um, childhood photographs to sort of look back and explore the child that I was and to sometimes see perhaps elements of the autism um, and also to see um, aspects of myself which um, I can recognize across the lifetime and see that I am a congruent being. I was that person. I am that same person. And uh, the image on the top right where I'm sitting between my parents and I'm probably um, looking towards my sister who's probably taking the photograph um, and I'm performing in a way that I would perform now in front of the camera for myself and I, I just find that very uh, reassuring, um, it feels like a great connection and it, it sort of enables me to understand that the child in me knew who she was and um, this is one of the core tenets really of, of, of what I'm working with is this idea that if we can reconnect with ourselves pre-masking, uh, potentially, hopefully pre-trauma, and we can um, begin to work through and understand who we are, uh, what the authentic core of us is. So that's a, that's a, big, a big plus with this method, I think. So what are the project outcomes at this research and development stage? So there will be an online PDF exhibition called Origin Story, 
which will be a series of images revisiting, documenting and performing and reflecting on key life experiences. So that's my sort of journaling life review element. Uh, Origin Story will present a playful narrative reworking my life story from a neurodivergent perspective using primary sources from my family collection, previous photography and newly commissioned costumes. And I think this is a, a very powerful message that I can give to late diagnosed people that you can rework a narrative, you can um, tell your own story in your very own way. Um, and it can be it can be extremely rewarding and empowering. I will also be creating an online workbook detailing my process works and the methodology of the project as a guide for others. There will, as I said, be a series of reflective writings and online talks, and also a series of conversations to invite participants for the next stage of the project. And I think that is my last slide, it is. So I just want to say thank you very much for um, listening to this presentation and please do visit Neurophototherapy on Instagram. Thank you so much.